All right. So, first of all, let's get this on screen. <laughs> first of all, I just want to say I'm a little bit embarrassed about my outfit, that I'm not as handsome as uh, uh, Florida over here or Vanessa in the other room. The truth is, I brought a really nice stylish shirt to wear today, but my hotel room didn't have an iron. I called them at 7 in the morning, and they took way too long to bring it up, so I just thought, like, you know, I was actually panicking this morning, called my boyfriend and was like, I don't have anything else to wear, just the trekking gear for this weekend, and like, maybe I'll just go on stage and look like a mountaineer. So he was like, it's okay, it's a developer conference. And I was like, that's right, I'm going to just be myself and be comfortable and be really cozy, like a, a mountaineer talking about augmented reality. So let me just introduce myself. My name is Raisa, and I'm a creative engineer at Google. Um, my team one day was looking for ways to use augmented reality in one of our marketing campaigns. So I took the liberty of just doing the research on my own, seeing what's possible. And naturally, I just started digging out into the history, got really excited about the, as the many, many years that it has gone back and wanted to share with my team um, to help them appreciate what it is today and, of course, do my actual job of reporting back what's possible today and in the future. So. <laughs> what is possible in the future. Um, actually, and before I start, I want to just make a really quick disclaimer that I'm, all, this research, all this research I did was on my own. It's all public knowledge. And with that being said, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of my company or any of the organizations I'm a part of. So let's step back into history, all the way back into 1901. This was a time before airplanes, before traditional color photography that we know, and nearly a decade before the world's the first talking motion picture. Yet before all of these technological advancements, we had a visionary author called L. Frank Baum, who you see up here. And he envisioned a world in a novel that he wrote called The Master Key. He wrote about a world where one could put on a pair of spectacles, and the people that he would look at it would overlay a character over their head. And this, this device was called a character marker. So basically, he's looking around and can judge a person on a single look. So this was, these were some really deep sci-fi thoughts back in 1901. Such, like, I can't even imagine how he could have come up with this idea. Um, and if the name rings a bell, he's the author of The Wizard of Oz. So maybe it's not so surprising after all. Then fast forward to 1968. We, a lot has happened in this time. America has built the first 747. We've orbited the moon from Apollo 8. And at the same time, we have the world's first head-mounted display. This was developed by a Harvard professor called Ivan Sutherland. And this display that you see here, it was so heavy, it had to be mounted from the ceiling. And there's this funny video on YouTube where you can see him like spinning around, and all he's seeing is this really simple wire cube. So after all this hard work, you saw this visionary cube in space. And this was a really important precursor to AR, because as you'll see, there's been so many advancements with head-mounted displays these days. And now, looking at 2018, we have a rocket orbiting into space with a car that's now somewhere out there floating. Um, but at the same time, we also have all of these advancements in augmented reality. Everyone is talking about when it's going to be the next big thing for the past few years. Um, technologists and investors alike are speculating on when this is going to really blow up. So what is happening after all of these years? You see that there's rich history of over a century ago um, that dates back augmented reality since at least 1901. So if you look at this chart from Google Trends, um, in case you haven't used it before, the y-axis is the search interest from 0 to 100, and on the x-axis we have time. So I'm I did a search back until the past two and a half years to see how interested people were in augmented reality. And as you can see, there's some interesting activity going on here. S suddenly, in the summer of 2016, we see a huge peak, and people are curious about this mysterious AR thing that they've just heard of. And this is when Pokemon Go was released. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we have people using this cool new app and wondering, like, whoa, what is augmented reality? And I want, what else is possible with this thing? Um, this opened up, this was probably the most uh, popular AR application, although, as we'll see, it's not 
fully AR capable, and they're working on um, that application, fully AR Pokemon Go soon. But um, this really opened people, consumers' eyes into the possibilities of AR and really showed the potential um, for its scale. Then later in more recent years, around the fall of 2017, we have another peak that's starting to rise. And although it's not as high as Pokemon Go, this was from AR Core and AR Kit, which were announced roughly around the same time. And these are developer kits that will allow people to build experiences um, such as Pokemon Go in a much easier and much more uh, streamlined way. So as a quick definition, AR Core is a platform for building augmented reality apps on Android. And AR Kit is Apple's version for building um, AR apps on iOS. Uh, looking back a few more years, this is as far back as you can go on Google Trends uh, from 2004. You see that there's actually some activity going on. People are actually interested and aware of augmented reality, especially around 2009. So that was almost 10 years ago. And why does it seem like it's such a new thing now? This is when AR Toolkit was released for web. It's an open source um, toolkit. I guess if you want to compare it to AR Core and AR Kit, this allowed developers to, to build um, web-based AR applications. So um, this was actually, the output would be flash-based. So this is one of the reasons why it didn't really take on, because users have to install a plugin, and then they kind of have to like use their webcam in a weird way that is, doesn't feel, not feel natural, compared to a mobile device where you can take it around with you, and it makes more sense to like kind of point at what you want to um, project your AR object onto. So this really shows its date. The documentation of AR Toolkit, or this publication about it, um, describes what AR Toolkit is. It shows um, AR Toolkit in action. And as you can see, it's marker-based. So they have this um, code where it will project the, the object um, from the code. And then in the documentation, you can also see that uh, it's using Windows XP and telling you how to use a webcam on your computer. Um, then later in 2009, we have the introduction of augmented reality into the real world. So Esquire, post, uh, Esquire published this um, issue. It was an augmented reality special. And on the front cover, you had this QR code that you could scan. And then something magical happens. Robert Downey, Downey Jr. comes out of the screen and starts like acknowledging you. <laughs> and then there was also, um, as you saw on the previous screen, there's, there were 12 pages of AR content. and. Um, lots of publications were talking about it, and it was really um, becoming more noticeable to consumers. So fast forwarding to today, we have, um, back in 2012, Google Hangouts filters, uh, which is actually long before Snapchat, which many people don't know, um, Snapchat's world lenses. We have a huge advancement of head-mounted displays like the uh, Microsoft HoloLens. And then, of course, Pokemon Go is very well known, and the IKEA, one of uh, IKEA, IKEA's um, furniture app from Apple's, the Apple Store. So what's making this possible today is that we have much more powerful devices, much more powerful browsers that will hopefully soon be capable of AR. Um, developers are more well equipped with toolkits like AR Core and AR Kit. And hopefully, future support on the web will help to bring this technology to the masses. So let's go back to basis and basics and talk about what defines augmented reality apps. Um, so AR Core, again, is the software developer kit that allows developers to use these defining AR features in, AR, in Android applications. And these defining features include motion tracking, which allows the device to understand and track its position relative to the real world, so a scare code you can place into the world and move around, and it looks like it's stationary, just like these people next to it. And environmental understanding, so that the device can detect the size and location of, uh, previously it was only horizontal surfaces, but now with the release of AR Core 1.0, you can also uh, place it on textured surfaces. And there was this cool um, demo of placing things on the snow, like uh, around the tree, which is pretty cool. Um, and then light estimation, which allows a device to estimate the lighting conditions. And this really helps bring objects to life, because even the subtleties like shadows and uh, brightness can really make um, an object in the, in the real world look real. So 
Previously, we have um, we had a platform called Tango, which allowed augmented reality on these really powerful devices. Um, but as these were very specialized, we decided we wanted to bring this to the masses. And that's when we really focused our efforts um, from late last year um, on AR Core, which will make it make augmented reality possible on more Android devices. So that is a huge challenge, but also a really big opportunity. The fact that there are two billion plus active devices out there running on Android, and each of these has their own r unique hardware requirements, um, hardware specs that we have to make sure align and provide the same high quality experience that we want all users to have. So currently, um, with the most recent release, it works on 100 million devices, which includes 13 unique models that you see here. And we're working with partners to make sure that um, more devices can support this. And going back to AR kits, this is a software developer kit allowing developers to use the same essential features in iOS 11. The way to describe it, it's, it's very similar to the three um, basic AR features that, that um, AR Core suggests. Um, those are basically um, essential AR features, not AR core. Like they're, they're, they can be um, described for any augmented reality app. Um, and their device compatibility is all um, most recent Apple devices, so with the A9 plus, A9 chip or above, running iOS 11 and up. So that includes iPhone 6S and up, and um, some of the newer iPads. So let's talk about building for web, because all of this AR Core and AR Kit allows you to build native apps, but this is a JS conference, so you guys are probably bored thinking about building an app. Um, we want to build for web. So let's see what's possible. Um, AR Core currently has an experiment where they're exploring the possibilities of web support, which would be awesome, because it will lower the barrier to entry, and people can build apps and release them to, out to the web. Um, so this is like a pre-standards experimentation, just trying to see what's po explore what's possible. And it's basically a, a wrapper of Chromium, and it's extending web VR features so that um, it's really scalable and um, allows for fallbacks and uh, across multiple devices. So they have this cool demo called Article, which you can download on GitHub. Um, just npm install all the dependencies and run it on the Webpack server, and it's super easy. Um, and just to explain, AR Core for web is not one single entity. It's basically you're building a web app with AR capabilities. Um, you're using JS libraries to build the 3D objects, and then you are running it on this experimental browser that's supposed to emulate what the web standards might look like. And currently, they have experimental browsers that work on both Android and iOS. So they're called AR, Web AR on AR Core and Web AR on AR Kit, respectively. Um, and most of the examples on the web AR for AR core um, demos are built with 3.js. Uh, it's a really popular 3D modeling library that's been used since 2010. Um, some of Google's projects have used it, including the Poly library, um, this educational exper experience called Interland, and all of these other cool um, Google and non-Google experiments that you see here. Um, and it allows you to create 3D shapes, animations, complex scenes, and gives you some tools to make this a lot easier for you. Because as you'll find, 3D modeling concepts are really hard. Um, so this is one of the tools that it provides. Um, it, it's an in-browser kind of shape editor, <laughs> or scene editor. Um, and it allows you to control all these different parameters. Um, and it's a really good way to kind of start learning 3D modeling, and especially if you haven't been paying attention in math class like I did, you have to relearn kind of UV mapping and vectors and matrix multiplication, and it really sometimes is uh, a little bit overwhelming. But with tools like this, it becomes a lot easier. And if you get good, you can make some crazy 3D shapes like this. But if you are having trouble with uh, 3D modeling, you can also download some um, models on Poly and find all these different kinds of cheeseburgers, uh, <laughs> anything, like just basically search for the term, and you'll find different items that are tagged with that uh, description. And if you really like these cheeseburgers, you can put it all together, start throwing them in the air, <laughs> and then that's your AR app. So um, just to 
just to highlight what's possible with 3.js, this is one of the apps that my team has built called Kibla Finder, and it helps people find the direction of Kibla, which is the direction of prayer during Ramadan. And um, basically, we use 3.js, but AR Core and AR Kit were not yet available, and this was also a web app, so we kind of had to get creative. Um, and this is basically uh, just using WebRTC to uh, use the camera and um, navigation APIs. And basically, it's projecting this into space rather than, as we've learned um, as an essential AR feature, um, it doesn't allow you to kind of place it onto a detected surface. So it's, it's a kind of like faux AR, but it, it's, um, I guess you can compare it to Pokemon Go, where you're not really placing the, you're not really throwing the, the Pokeball onto the, um, the Pokemon that's, it's not on the floor, it's kind of just like sometimes it's floating around. Um, so that's kind of one distinction of what's possible with uh, 3JS and how we need to bridge the gap. So to bridge those gaps, there is a library called 3.ar.js, which kind of um, detects the device compatibility and um, enables the AR web utilities by interfacing with the web VR extension that is um, exposed by the experimental browsers. So that's what's allowing you to throw things onto surfaces and detect it with precision. So putting it all together, you can create some really useful apps like, for example, this living room um, modeling. Um, there's some really useful things you can do for consumers to make this really widely adapted. And especially if it's available for the web, then people can just reach these experiment experiences from a link and access them if their device is compatible. So again, the web AR and AR core implementation is just an exploration right now to explore what's possible and what might be um, potential web standards, but there are also a lot more web implementations. Um, for example, Mozilla has their web XR standards proposal, which um, there's a lot of commonalities between the different pre-standards proposals right now, so that's a good sign that things are starting to align and hopefully we have some standards soon. Uh, there's also the Argon browser and Argon.js, and I think one of the most popular ones might be the marker-based AR.js. Um, and if you recognize the markers from my earlier slides, it's because it's based on AR toolkit. So um, it goes way back. So with all of these standards that are not really fully in place, why should we care about it now? Like, What if it changes and stressing you guys out to learn all these new things? But um, as you know, um, with 3D modeling, it's, it's a really big concept to grasp. And if you start learning it now, like there's a lot to catch up on. People are already using 3JS and have been 3D modeling for decades. So it's really good. If you're interested in it now, then you should start equipping yourself with the basic knowledge to get started. And people are already building really cool stuff right now. So some uh, sources of inspiration. There's some AR core specific um, examples on this is arcore.com. There's also an AR kit version at the bottom there. And one of my personal favorites is this one from um, g.co slash AR experiments, which just features some of Google's, um, I mean, not bias or anything, but some of Google's um, AR experiments. But one of the reasons why I love it so much is that half of the experiments on there were created by women. So that's really awesome to show that representation in the web XR community. And going back to Ivan Sutherland, the Harvard professor who created the first head-mounted display, he said that the screen is a window through which one sees a virtual world. And the challenge is to make that world look real, act real, sound real, and feel real. So with all these technological advancements in the past century or so, I think we're getting really close to that. And although we might not be close to these you know, really complex head-mounted displays that can control an armored suit or anything, I think it's really exciting that we can, we're getting really close to building web-based AR applications because that's is what's really going to make AR become more widespread. So thank you guys for listening. <laughs>